kicking off the list at number 10, Wolverine. Wolverine has had a pretty crazy past, so it's no surprise he's gone down a few dark roads. In the movie Logan, we see two Wolverines battling it out and it's glorious and it's gory. It's so gory. In Age of Apocalypse, Logan goes from being an X-Men to the Horseman of Death. It's a great comic. Yeah, Apocalypse actually had Wolverine square up against Sabretooth in order to see who becomes the new Horseman. Wolverine, of course, came out on top and Apocalypse restored the adamantium to his skeleton. Quite the deal if you ask me. And to make matters worse, Apocalypse replaced Wolverine with a scroll so the X-Men wouldn't notice. So there's a few comics here that could blend nicely into the MCU, like Apocalypse replacing Wolverine with a scroll. This is totally possible. With Ryan Reynolds confirming that the next Deadpool would have included Logan on this road trip, that plus the fact that they're best friends in real life. I mean, Adam Sandler has like 15 of his friends in every movie, so I'm sure they're planning to bring Logan in with Deadpool in that deal in some way, shape, or form. Would it be Apocalypse making him evil? Probably not, but never say never. And before we continue on with this list, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be so helpful. It helps our channel out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Tap that thumbs up. Let's keep this video going. Number nine, Pyro. Pyro was once a student at the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. And in X-Men 2, we see him hanging out with Iceman and Rogue. He's having a great time just hanging out with some super students. But by the end of the movie, he switches over to Magneto's side, facing off against Bobby. In the comics, St. John Allardyce made his first appearance as Pyro in X-Men 141. He was born and raised in Australia, and his powers, well, as you could probably guess, has something to do with fire. When he was young, he met Mystique, and then he ended up joining her new brotherhood of evil mutants. We need more fire bad guys, plain and simple. We have none in the MCU. I mean, we had some, kind of, with Spider-Man Far From Home, but that was all just Mysterio being mysterious. Number eight, Shadow King. Making his first appearance in X-Men 117, the Shadow King is a multiversal manifestation of the dark side of the human consciousness. Spawned, of course, by the first nightmare. Amal Farouk was the leader of an underground syndicate located in the Thieves Quarter of Cairo, Egypt. He's a powerful mutant who also happened to be a vessel for said Shadow King. Farouk was able to control everybody around him, and it's pretty terrifying. He feeds on the shadows of your soul. So yeah, with Marvel now veering off to the cosmic side of things, I I think we can get a Shadow King behind the scenes secretly just sucking the life out of our world's finest. In the comics before World War II, Amal Farouk worked with Baron Von Strucker to try and destabilize Britain's political structure. So maybe this guy has been here the whole time and he's just been lurking in the shadows. We just don't know it yet. I mean, he is the Shadow King. We're not going to really see him. He's here. He's here right now. He's been here the whole time. Number seven, Orcus. Orcus is a combination of a variety of government organizations, some more noble than others. The money and structure behind Orcus has been provided by such iconic organizations as AIM, SHIELD, and STRIKE primarily. With smaller investments belonging to organizations such as SWORD, Alpha Flight, Hammer, Armor, and even Hydra. The goal of Orcus is to protect humanity from growing global threats, which in this case involve mutants. Their plotting caused Professor X to create a task force to stop the creation of a mother mold which he and Moira McTaggart believed would be the beginning of the end for mutants in regards to the Nimrod tech that the Mother Mold would produce. However, we later discovered in the new X-Men series that the work of scientist Alia Gregor, who is affiliated with Orcus, proves that this assumption may have actually been wrong, and that Nimrod tech may continue to be a threat to the X-Men, even with the Mother Mold destroyed. Also, now, Alia has got an even bigger hate on for the mutants and the X-Men after the death of her husband, which happened when the mutant team infiltrated the Orcus space station and destroyed the mother mold. Number six, Strife. Making his debut in New Mutants issue 87, Strife was the clone of Nathan Summers, the son of Cyclops and Madeline Pryor, Cable. So we just saw Cable as a new main character slash villain in Deadpool 2, and he was played by Josh Brolin. So I don't think he'll be coming to the MCU. Or at least if he does, they may have to do it with this way, with Strife. That way they can bend the original story and use alternate futures however they please, with the character more or less staying true to the comics. He's a clone of Cable from the future. He has this bad armor, he's a telepathic and telekinetic mutant, and Cable, who has devoted his psionic powers to basically ensure that this techno-organic virus doesn't get his right side as well, Strife doesn't need to worry about that, so he's OP. He's an OG who is OP. The MCU could for sure use Strife. The timelines are getting quite intricate, so it can be explainable, and we'll buy it if Strife comes in. We'll definitely buy it. Number five, Solemn. Solemn is one of the new hotties on the X-Men villain block. That would be fun to imagine, just all these hot X-Men supervillains as neighbors. 
Hmm, sounds like a chaotic good time. Solemn is a mutant of Arako who, instead of having adamantium bones, possesses adamantium skin. He was one of the sword bearers of Arako during the Ten of Swords tournament. In fact, he was the one mutant we thought would face off against Wolverine. But in an unexpected turn, Solemn didn't even really fight at all. He was initially set to fight against one of his own because this was Saturnine's tournament and it was gloriously weird. Instead, though, Solemn used a favor owed to him by Wolverine from when they both had to venture to hell to get their Muramasa blades to use in said tournament, making Wolverine tap in and fight on his behalf. Solemn is presented as being a smooth talker, master manipulator, and overall tricksy kind of person. Maybe that's why I like him so much? Number 4. Dark Phoenix Jean Grey is an Omega level mutant born with telekinetic and telepathic powers. Seeing the potential in Jean's strength, the Phoenix Force attached itself to her while she was in danger during a space mission with the Fantastic Four. I mean, come on guys, it's X-Men 101. Literally, the issue you can find this in is X-Men 101. I am Phoenix! Boom! Okay, so this dark, powerful cosmic force started to change her for the worse. She ended up destroying a solar system that killed like billions of people. We just finished watching Wanda have the breakdown of a century every Friday for weeks, so we'll gladly watch Jean Grey deal with the Phoenix Force in a similar fashion. Totally. Now with the fact that Jean Grey wasn't the one to do these evil acts and she was being used as a vessel, rings a bit too close to Wanda's story, but never say never. Number 3. Madeline Pryor I mean, y'all know how I feel about Maddie. Madeline Pryor is probably one of my favorite X-Men villains around, especially because you can't help but feel for her if you know her backstory. Often referred to as the Goblin and queen, a lot of what makes Maddie so hot is just her dominant energy. She is a woman who gets what she wants no matter the cost, which has obviously driven her to do some pretty terrible things. The really tragic thing about Maddie though is that at the end of the day, she really just wants to be seen and loved and accepted, and it's like everything she does to try and get what she wants almost pushes her further away from happiness. She is the very epitome of the quote, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. She's deadly, dangerous, usually very unhinged, often filled with rage, but also very tragic. What is there not to love here? She's just so complex. I love characters that are complex. If you're a complex character in a comic, you're probably hot to me. Number two, Scarlet Witch. No more mutants. Scarlet Witch, aka Wanda Maximoff, she is the daughter of Magneto and the twin brother of Quicksilver, aka Ralph Boner, aka Petro Maxima. Now, she was on her father's Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, but at one point she did join the Avengers as well, of course. She's one of Marvel's biggest heroes and she's trending every single Friday for a reason. And then in Marvel's M Day, she kind of became the ultimate evil when she spoke those three words, and just like that, a mass amount of mutants were depowered or killed. That large number being 986,618, give or take. Only leaving a couple hundred left on the planet. WandaVision was great because we finally got to see this Scarlet Witch, we saw this villain side to her. And I'd be happy to see more at any time, especially with more mutants now on the way. And number one, Magneto. Of course, number one, this is the most ideal scenario, I'd love for this to happen. He made his first appearance in X-Men 1 back in 1963. Magneto is a mutant with the ability to generate and control magnetic fields. He's a master of magnetism. He was a close friend with Professor X, but of course they came to a few disagreements over the idea that humans and mutants could coexist peacefully. And his horrible childhood makes a pretty fair point for said argument. He created the Brotherhood of Mutants and the Acolytes, and he worked with the X-Men before. When Professor X needed to leave Earth, Magneto stepped in to take his place and continued to teach his students how to use their powers. After this, he became a hero in a way, guiding the new mutants, but again, he's one of those guys that constantly flips back and forth in the comics. And for a while, fans, including myself, were hoping that Magneto was going to be the one behind WandaVision's madness somehow, or he would come in from another universe and then explain to Wanda what's going on and be the bearer of bad news almost. I think Magneto should still be one of the first mutants introduced, especially if they go Ultimate Magneto, because he actually takes out Xavier in those comics, and also thousands of people as well. So there's that. He would be a cool villain to come over, definitely. Number 10, Children of the Vault. The Children of the Vault are their own race who seek to rule the world. They are neither mutants nor humans, though they did evolve from the human race. The children are part of a race that descended from humans, having been technologically evolved over the course of 6,000 years. They believe only one race should rule Earth and plan on becoming said race. One of their members, Seraphina, recently resurfaced in the Dawn of X X Men series, having escaped from Orcus, who had somehow captured her. Before Wolverine could catch her, though, she returned to the vault, where she was also seen rejoining the other children. 
Number 9. Phalanx So the phalanx are kind of complex. If you are familiar with the phalanx, it's probably because you are familiar with the Annihilation Conquest story arc from 2007 to 2008. The phalanx work basically to destroy matter and upload it to a hive mind of data using the techno-organic virus, assimilating all organic and inorganic matter that they come across in the universe. So they're basically like the technarchy, but the phalanx share a collective mind where the technarchy are individuals. Phalanx aim to absorb all matter in the universe and eventually make Managed to threaten all of Earth and mutant kind, respectively. It is only through Moira's regeneration abilities that we know the great risk this high mind tech race could pose and has posed to the X Men and all of life before, in a previous one of Moira's lives. Number 8 The Supremacy The Supremacy sought to take down and defeat the X Men in an alternate future. We learn a bit more about them in Powers of X. They were the ones behind Nimrod the Lesser and eventually Nimrod the Greater and their library of Homo sapiens and mutants alike. After years of Breeding mutants in camps to use as their slaves and hounds to fight against their own kind who had revolted, they went a step further, literally dissolving mutants in tanks of femto fluid until they were reduced to nothing but the data that comprised them. Ugh. They would then be stored in a great library where the data that their corpses provided could be used to win the war, the war against mutant kind. Eventually, the war became obsolete, however, making this whole process and the library that stored this data almost eerily useless, which is creepier. Don't put me in femto fluid, please. Number seven, Lady Mastermind. Mastermind himself is maybe one of the least attractive villains to me. Maybe it's the way that he operates, manipulating people's minds, or maybe it's just his really whiny nature in the original X Men comics, or the fact that then he really couldn't take no for an answer, constantly attempting to win Scarlet Witch over to no avail. However, his daughter, on the other hand, Reagan Wingard, aka Lady Mastermind, is a certified hottie. One, she is just overall more physically attractive to me anyways but two she is also less whiny than her dad in general which I also like this might possibly be because she is more powerful than him and she doesn't really feel the need to prove how capable she is so she doesn't get whiny of course it could also be because mastermind himself has paved the way for his daughter meaning that her name and her abilities already mean something because of all of her dad has accomplished over time improving her reputation as a capable villain so doesn't need to be as whiny. Number six, Chen Zhao. Chen Zhao is a very wealthy politician. He was publicly humiliated by Kate Pride. Yeah, she's dropped Kitty and she's going by Kate Pride now. And Bishop. She was humiliated when she attempted to blame mutants for her missing husband, who turned out had actually just joined a kind of cult of worshiping and celebrating mutants. So. That's kind of awkward for her. Frustrated, she decided to make a very generous donation to anti-mutant organizations and aims to continue her own fight in the war against mutants. She donated to one very specific anti-mutant organization actually, which we'll talk about soon. Number seven, Juggernaut. Kane Marco made his first comic book appearance in X-Men issue 12. Kane and Charles Xavier were serving together in the same unit, but when Kane was under fire, he ran off to take cover in a nearby cave. That cave was actually home to the lost temple of Sidorak. So Kane grabbed this glowing ruby from the lap of an idol, read the inscription, and possessed the power of the Crimson Bands of Sidorak, becoming a human juggernaut. And then an explosion went off, and Kane, the juggernaut, was trapped under the rubble, and Xavier took off. He got out of there. So after Kane dug himself out, he destroyed an entire village with the previous man who held the juggernaut mantle, Jin Taiko, getting taken out as well. I mean, we've literally seen him rip Deadpool in half, and if Deadpool's coming to the MCU, I really hope Juggernaut will as well. After all, last time we saw him in Deadpool 2, at the end of the movie, he was crawling out of that pool. He wasn't actually dead. He was just a little bit injured after Colossus laid him out with the help of some well-placed wires. Number four, Apoth. Apoth is the main antagonist of the new Fallen Angel series. Well, Apoth doesn't directly threaten all of mutant kind or all of X-Men, although at the end they're, they kind of mentioned it like they would be threatening that. They definitely found a strong enemy with one member of the X-Men, Psylocke. Or well, a version of Psylocke anyways. With Braddock and Quanon both being discarded as names for her, Psylocke sets out to seek out her daughter, who had been taken from her years ago when she worked for the Hand. Yeah, apparently she has a secret daughter, that's a thing. And to find a villain called Apoth. Also, I think we can assume because of the whole hand thing that this Psylocke is Quanon, but she doesn't want us to call her Quanon, so we won't do that. It turns out that Apoth is a god who also kind of has an army of children at their disposal and that they inhabit two sides of themselves, one light, one dark. Psylocke creates a team and works with Sinister to find and defeat Apoth for her own reasons, not knowing that in fact strings have also kind of been pulled in regards to this upcoming battle and why she's going to do it. Apoth is a powerful and psychic telepathic villain, but still proves to be no match for a Psylocke. Number three, Apocalypse. 
Making his first steps in Marvel Graphic Novel issue 17, it's undeniable how intimidating this Omega level mutant is. This guy is loaded with powers, he can suck the energy from you. Apocalypse can suck the energy out of anything and then use that power to shoot energy blasts or use that power to enhance his own strength and speed. Okay, not a bad start, we could definitely use someone like that in the MCU. And just by looking at Apocalypse, you can see that he's merged with celestial technology. His armor is futuristic, it's fun, this technology is wired throughout his body and also his headquarters, making Apocalypse able to teleport at times. Self-molecular manipulation allows for him to alter his physical form. He can get big, he can get small, whatever the case. He's also a super genius, especially when it comes to advanced technology, that stuff that I mentioned earlier. Even before being modified by the celestial ship, Apocalypse was already living for thousands of years. He just goes into a coma and then heals up. I mean, Talk about a beauty sleep, damn. In X-Men Age of Apocalypse from 1995, we see just how big and bad this guy can get. Oscar Isaac had a take on him in X-Men Apocalypse and it was great, that was super fun. Not as scary or big as the comics, but still a good time. So if Marvel needs a new big bad guy besides Kang, I think they should go here next. We love superhero teams fighting big bald guys. I mean, we can't get enough of it. Evidently, we'll pay to see it numerous times. Number two, Merck. Merck is a team and organization that was built out of the demilitarization that seems to have happened globally as a result of Krakoa being recognized as a nation. Call it a time of peace or call it an anxious time of reserved resources in preparation for the war to come. But regardless of the cause, Merck is comprised of former top paramilitary soldiers who seek out battle because, you know, they were kind of laid off, and as such, have become guns for hire. They are loyal to no nation. They were originally employed by Xeno to fight against the X-Force and X-Men, but may have also more recently been approached by the mutants themselves in regards to their services. So we'll have to wait and see. They were fighting against them, but maybe they can be used. Number one, Hominus Verendi. While the Marauders might operate separately from the X-Men, they are still comprised of a lot of former and current X-Men members, including one of the original team members, Bobby Drake. And it also includes Storm, yay! This team is led by Captain Kate and ends up going up against the anti-mutant organization, Hominus Verendi, which is comprised of former Inner Circle members of the Hellfire Club, sort of. Also, can we just acknowledge how great the Hellfire trading company is though. Separate of course from Herman is Verende, but still they're really cool and I just had to shout them out because yeah they're really fun. Herman is Verende were previously known as the unofficial Hellfire Brats and were originally part of the Hellfire Academy. The team also has their own White Queen, Black King and the like similar to Krakoa's Quiet Council and the former Hellfire Club. But of course they're all kids, they're all little non-mutants kids who just want to hate on mutants. Evil children, evil children. Number 10, Miss Sinister. Miss Sinister is a sinister clone who was implanted into the body of Claudine Ranko via a genetic virus. This virus was Mr. Sinister's failsafe should anything happen to him, which of course it did. He ended up being killed during the events of Messiah Complex. Following his death, however, this failsafe was activated, transforming Claudine Ranko into a perfect genetic copy of Mr. Sinister, but female. She also possessed Nathaniel Daniel's powers and his twisted personality. Claudine no longer existed and in her place was Miss Sinister. Miss Sinister wouldn't last forever and eventually Mr. Sinister would return to the comics taking her place. Although I do think the idea of female clones of Sinister also existing is just a pretty cool idea and I still kind of hope we could someday see a version of Miss Sinister brought back in the comics. I'm like I'm cool with there being a lot of clones of just Mr. Sinister but what about some Miss Sinister clones too? That, that could be cool. All of the Sinisters. Sinister dinosaurs as well. Number 9, Donald Pierce. It's kind of weird really that I think Donald Pierce is attractive, but here we are. Now you know that I'm into the weird Victorian aesthetic of the Hellfire Club. Surprise, surprise. I feel like people that do know me would be not surprised by that at all. And of course, I'm generally into that aesthetic, except for when it's being worn by Sebastian Shaw, of course. Sebastian is a brute, and I will never forgive him for what he did to Captain Kate and Lockheed. Blech. Donald Pierce is extremely anti-mutant, but then again, he's also an X-Men villain, and around pretty much half of that group of the X-Men villains are pretty focused on, you know, death to all mutants and that kind of stance. Donald Pierce himself was one of the original members we're introduced to of the Hellfire Club inner circle, holding the title initially of White Bishop. He's also part cyborg, which I'm also weirdly fine with. Even robots and, you know, part robots deserve love. Love for cyborgs. This message from Amanda McKnight. 
Everyone love a robot today. All right, friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more hot villains lists, which as I said, I can I can do that. There's lots of hot X-Men villains, and I know y'all are gonna be in the comments like, what about this person? So let's do a part two, and let me know you want that by giving this video a thumbs up. Number eight, Mr. Sinister. Mr. Sinister might seem like a weird one to include on this list, but have you seen him lately in the comics? He's a complete A-grade hottie. Something about Mr. Sinister with facial hair, just like rocking a beard, just really does it for me. Also, I love capes, and they're not super easy to pull off, so if you can pull off a cape, I think you deserve a spot on this list, which Mr. Sinister consistently does, so here he is. He's also just a really fun and creative villain, for better or sometimes for worse when it comes to plots. And if there is anything that screams hotness for me, it's creativity. I love creativity. Sure, he might be a mad geneticist, but he's a fun mad geneticist. You know what I mean? <laughs> Number five, Zeno. Although the creation and unity we have seen from the mutants in the Dawn of X relaunch has allowed them to shut down those programs who would use mutants as test subjects and as a means to advance human evolution, that doesn't mean that the people behind those organizations just disappear. In fact, it seems that instead the few people left who still believe in them have found one another and created a more secretive organization in the shadows known as Xeno. Xeno was the group behind the assassination of Charles Xavier in the X-Force series. And while X was successfully resurrected, Xeno still created quite a shiver of panic among the mutants of Krakoa. This organization will likely continue to pop up as an enemy to mutants and the X-Men throughout the relaunch. And they are ruthless, resourceful, and terrifying in their methods, successfully using the captured Domino's skin to ensure their assassination team success. Ick. Graphic. Get it? Because they graphed her skin? Uh, ew. Gotta get that luck though. Gotta just slap that luck skin on to ya. Number six, Callisto. With or without her tentacles, I'm just a big fan of Callisto. Callisto was at one point leader of the Morlocks and a villain to the X-Men. She kidnapped Angel and tried to make him marry her. Not a great look. Fortunately, I think for both of them, that didn't work out, so yay. Honestly, that would be a weird pairing if it had happened and then still existed now. What would that be like in the future? Callisto for a long time has been a recurring enemy of Storms. However, currently she has turned from being a villain to just being a straight up badass in the comics. She was depowered during M-Day, but still being a mutant, took refuge on Krakoa. She now works alongside the Hellfire Trading Company, acting as Emma Frost's The White Queen's White Knight. She also recently got her powers restored after fighting and dying in the Crucible Ceremony, asking Storm to fill in for Apocalypse as her own personal challenger. Storm and Callisto are pretty much cool now, so Storm actually did this for Callisto as a kindness, if that makes sense. If you're not reading the comics, it maybe doesn't make sense. Kill them not with kindness, but for kindness in this instance. That's what The Crucible's all about. If you want to know more about The Crucible, there's a whole X-Men issue on it from the last series of X-Men that started in 2019. Number five, Mr. Sinister. Dr. Nathaniel Essex made his first comic book debut in Uncanny X-Men 221. And he's not that easy to forget once you take one look at him. So in a world where S.W.O.R.D. was taking out Vision and Hydra's doing tests to make mutants in their secret labs, I totally think Mr. Sinister could show up with the X-Men and the MCU. After all, he's obsessed with experimenting on mutants, including himself. He was obsessed with Darwin's theory of evolution, but he felt like they were shackled by too many moral constraints. So that doesn't say anything. You're like, okay, this guy's messed. He couldn't get the funding from the Hellfire Club or, you know, Kickstarter wasn't around. So we got together a group that he named Marauders, and then you got them to kidnap people off the streets of London so he can experiment on them himself. He even tried to experiment on his son, who wasn't even alive. So yeah, he's a villain who likes to bring the dead back, so... Hey, we could always use one of those, for sure. Number four, Silver Samurai. Is there anything hotter than a well-trained swordsman and disciplined samurai? Silver Samurai has been a longtime enemy and sometimes frenemy of Logan, and is an iconic X-Men villain because of that. Whenever I think of Silver Samurai, or when I have seen him pop up on Krakoa lately, I always go back now in my mind to issue three of Wolverine's 1988 series. In that issue, we get to see him do some training in nothing but his undies and a mask. Oh, and he's wearing wrist bracers too. Gotta protect your wrists. The other thing I really find attractive about Silver Samurai is that despite being a villain, he still keeps to his own moral code, which is why he sometimes will even end up teaming up with his enemies or his rivals. If something is going on that he too does not agree with, he's willing to team up with even his enemies to put a stop to it. He's not too stubborn. 
and I like that. Number three, horticulture. I love these ladies so much. They are basically a villainous, eco terrorist version of the Golden Girls group. They are sassy, elderly women who used to work for corrupt and greedy biotech companies who did not care about the effects of their work in regards to the planet's well being. As such, these women decided to fight back. They planted their own seeds within the companies, hoping to infiltrate them over time so that they could then have control of all plant life on Earth, deciding what grows and what doesn't. However, with Krakoa's miracle plants and resulting pharma drugs hitting the market as a result of the mutant nation being recognized globally, their plans were kind of threatened. Horticulture formed, and these four women, Opal, Lily, Augusta, and Edith, threatened the mutants and Krakoa. They attacked with a green, sticky substance that appears to neutralize mutant powers and vowed to either cause Krakoa to join them or they would cut them down like the weed they are. I sincerely hope we get to see a lot more of them or that the mutants decide to team up with them because they're just hilarious and amazing. Number two, Celine. There is something so timeless about Celine, the way she is often drawn and even her mannerisms and the way I imagine her voice to sound in the comics. This is probably because, well, she is actually ancient. Something I find very attractive about her is just that, her timelessness, her, her wisdom. But of course there is also the knowledge that she could drain the life force right out of you, just like that. Celine is an energy vampire who feeds on the life force of others. Her powers pretty much make her instantly a great and deadly villain. An immortal mutant, Celine is also a member of the group known as the Externals, not to be confused with the Eternals. That's that's a different group. The Externals are an immortal group of mutants who are generally all ancient and are often known for being unstoppable or at least notoriously hard to kill. Number 1, Mystique. Is anyone surprised that Mystique took our top spot? I know I'm not. For me, it's not even Mystique's outward appearance, whatever she chooses it to be, her standard blue or another version. Mystique is attractive because of her drive. She goes for what she wants and she never gives up. She doesn't usually apologize and although she's a villain, there are many times she has done things not with malicious intent, but because she thought it was the right thing to do in the end. I love Mystique for so many reasons, but I think the fact that she is a survivor is what I admire the most about her. She often does her own thing for her own reasons and often to ensure her own survival. There is something so powerful and just so cool about that. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's also good to think of others and be compassionate. I'm not saying we should all be like Mystique all the time. That, that would be a lot, but I think there is something admirable in her ability to completely accept herself unapologetically and trust in her own ambitions and her own plans. For me, that's what attracts me to a lot of female villains. It's like this rebellion against all the constraints of what it means to be good. It's the anti of what I feel like is expected of me as a woman and just a human in general. And it's fun sometimes to like be the opposite of that, you know? Be good, but then also be bad and be free. Thank you.